good evening aspirants welcome to the hindi news analysis by shankar ias academy for the date 28th september 2019 these are the list of articles chosen for today's analysis it has been given along with the page numbers of chennai bengaluru delhi tiruvannapuram and hyderabad editions the link for the handwritten notes and the time stamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below and for the benefit of smartphone users the time stamping is also provided in the comment section Let's move on to the first article analysis for the day. This news article is about Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve of Tamil Nadu. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. The news article which we have taken for analysis talks about the Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve and the controversy regarding its eco-sensitive zone. So first you should know that what is a tiger reserve tiger reserves are the areas that are notified for the protection of tiger and its prey it is governed by project tiger this project tiger was launched in the year 1973 it was launched with the objective of conservation of endangered tiger species and also for harmonizing or balancing the rights of tribal people who are living in the tiger reserve and around the tiger reserves Now a tiger reserve includes two zones one is core zone and the second one is buffer zone the core zone is the critical tiger habitat area which is established on the basis of scientific data these areas are required to be kept safe from violation by people it is for the purpose of tiger conservation without affecting the rights of scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers and the next zone which is the buffer zone it is the peripheral or the outer area to the core zone as you can see in this picture this area requires lesser habitat protection this area provides buffer zone for the tigers that are moving from the critical tiger habitats this zone promotes coexistence between wildlife and human activity it also gives due recognition for the livelihood of the local people their developmental rights social rights and their cultural rights so with this background let us discuss in brief about the satyamangalam wildlife sanctuary and tiger reserve in order to protect the wildlife in tamil nadu an area of 1411.6 square kilometer in the erode district of tamil nadu was declared as satyamangalam wildlife sanctuary in the year 2008 This area was declared as a sanctuary under section 26A of the Wildlife Protection Act. This section 26A deals with the declaration of an area as a sanctuary. Under this section, the state government shall issue a notification and in this notification, the state government shall specify the limits of the area which shall be comprised within the sanctuary and it can also declare the date from which that area will be declared as a sanctuary. Now also know that The Satyamangalam Wildlife Sanctuary and Tiger Reserve is the largest wildlife sanctuary in the state of Tamil Nadu. Then after this in order to protect the endangered species of tiger an area of 1408.4 square kilometer of sanctuary was declared as Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve. So out of 1411.6 square kilometers 1408.4 square kilometer have been declared as tiger reserve. now we are saying tiger as an endangered species because it is listed as endangered by the iucn red list of threatened species and this area was declared as a tiger reserve under section 38v of wildlife protection act of 1972 this section deals with tiger conservation plan under this section the state government can notify an area as a tiger reserve based on the recommendation of the tiger conservation authority now you have to know that the satyamangalam tiger reserve is located in the strategic confluence region that is at the junction of western and eastern ghats so this tiger reserve acts as a bridge between these two major landscapes now because of this this region becomes a vast territory for the tigers moving between the regions that is moving between the western ghats and the eastern ghats and the news article says that this satyamangalam tiger reserve is critical to accommodate the pillover population of tigers which means it is very important to accommodate the tigers which are moving from one area to the other it is said that these tigers are from the nearby mudumalai tiger reserve bandipur tiger reserve and the nilgiri north forest division and even if you see the all india tiger estimation of 2018 which was released in july 2019 
it stated that this Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve has registered the highest growth in tiger numbers in India since 2014. So by this we can know that this Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve has played a crucial role in the conservation of tigers in this particular region. Now the news article also talks about eco-sensitive zones. So before getting into what the article says, let us first understand this concept. Eco-sensitive zones is also known as ecologically fragile areas. These eco-sensitive zones are areas which are notified by the Union Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change around the protected areas, national parks and around the wildlife sanctuaries. The purpose of declaring eco-sensitive zones is to create some kind of shock absorbers to the protected areas. Shock absorbers are those which helps to reduce the worst effects on the environment which is caused by human activity. Now this acts as a shock absorber by regulating and managing the activities around these protected areas. And these eco-sensitive zones also act as a transition zone from areas of high protection to areas involving lesser protection. So we can say that the eco-sensitive zones are the buffer zones to the core areas because core areas have a higher protection. So how much area is designated as eco-sensitive zones? According to the Wildlife Conservation Strategy of 2002, the lands which are falling within 10 km of the boundaries of national parks and sanctuaries, they should be notified as eco-fragile zones or eco-sensitive zones. And it is done under the Section 3 of Environment Protection Act of 1986. Now this Section 3 of Environment Protection Act empowers the central government to take all necessary measures for protecting and improving the quality of the environment and also preventing and controlling environmental pollution. Along with this, certain other provisions of the act are also used by the government to declare an area as eco-sensitive zone. But it is to be noted that the act does not mention the word eco-sensitive zone. So based on this section, the Union Ministry of Environment had framed guidelines for the declaration of eco-sensitive zones in the year 2011. According to this guidelines, some activities are permitted in the eco-sensitive zones while some activities are regulated and some are prohibited. So what are these activities? First, let us see the permitted activities. The permitted activities in these zones are ongoing agricultural and horticultural practices which is carried out by the local communities. Then the rainwater harvesting in those zones and the organic farming carried out in these zones and even the adoption of green technology for all the activities etc. are permitted in these eco-sensitive zones. Green technology is the technology which is used to mitigate or reverse the effects of human activity on the environment. So these kinds of technology are permitted in these eco-sensitive zones. Now let us see about the regulated activities in these zones. It includes felling of trees, establishment of hotels and resorts in these areas and commercial use of natural water resources and even erection of electrical cables, then use of polythene bags by shopkeepers in these areas and then the movement of vehicle at night in these areas and also the widening of roads in these areas are all regulated in these eco-sensitive zones. So now what are the activities which are prohibited in the eco-sensitive zones? First one is commercial mining and then setting of saw mills and even industries which cause pollution such as which cause air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, even noise pollution are prohibited in these zones and even establishment of major hydroelectric projects then commercial use of wood then tourism activities in these zones are prohibited and these tourism activities include overflying the national park area by using hot air balloons and even the aircrafts are prohibited in these zones then the discharge of effluents is prohibited in these eco-sensitive zones it means the discharge of liquid wastes or sewage into the river that is situated in that area and even the discharge of any solid waste or even production of hazardous substances in these zones are prohibited. So this is about the eco-sensitive zones. Now the news article says that according to a draft notification the eco-sensitive zone which is around the Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve will be reduced to 0 to 1 kilometer. 
Now we saw in the beginning that according to the wildlife conservation strategy of 2002, lands which are falling within 10 km of the boundaries of the sanctuaries should be notified as eco-fragile zones. But this draft notification says that for the Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve, it will be reduced to 0 to 1 km. So that means around 90 percentage of the area will be taken away from the eco-sensitive zone. For this move, some activists have blamed that this move is to help the mining and real estate lobby that is to allow mining and real estate in that eco-sensitive zone. We just now saw that commercial mining is a prohibited activity in the eco-sensitive zones and the establishment of hotels and resorts are regulated activities under eco-sensitive zones. So the activists are saying that by reducing the effective buffer zone or the eco-sensitive zone, the mining industries will be able to extend their operation to the area which was before eco-sensitive zone and in the same zone the real estate activity will be more. So from this we can say that the shock observer to this Satyamangalam tiger reserve is reduced. So by this the tiger population may be threatened. With this we have come to the end of this news article discussion. The display practice question will be discussed in the last session. This news article is about punch shield. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. Recently, the People's Republic of China celebrated its 70th anniversary. Here, People's Republic of China is the government of China, which was set up in 1949 after the victory of communist forces of Mao Zedong. So, officially China is known as People's Republic of China. Hence, the Chinese embassy in India celebrated the same. It was organized by the India-China Friendship Association. This India-China Friendship Association or the China-India Friendship Association is a national people's organization of the People's Republic of China. That is, it is the National People's Organization of China. It was initiated in May 16, 1952. It was initiated by Chinese cultural art circles. But in the year 1962, it was suspended and later it was resumed in the year 1992. This China-India Friendship Association aims at enhancing mutual understanding and friendship between the Chinese and Indian peoples. It also aims at enhancing and safeguarding world peace and it aims at promoting exchanges and cooperation between India and China on various fields such as uh, on politics, economy, trade, culture, social program, technology, education, health, tourism and other areas. So this association celebrated the 70th anniversary of People's Republic of China. During this celebration, the Chinese ambassador to India has urged India to follow the principle of peaceful coexistence or Panchashil which was devised in the Nehruvian era. Nehruvian era means the time period when Jawaharlal Nehru was Prime Minister of India. The Chinese ambassador to India also noted that the principle of punch shield should be followed in bilateral relations between India and China. This is to ensure peaceful coexistence of both the nations. So what is this principle of peaceful coexistence or the principle of punch shield? In Hindi, punch means five and shield means good conduct or a moral conduct. So we can say that punch shield are the five principles. And these five principles were devised for the peaceful coexistence of nations. This Panchashil was devised 60 years ago. It was devised in a response to a world which was asking for a new set of principles for the conduct of international relations. And this conduct should reflect the aspirations of all nations which wanted to coexist and prosper together in peace and harmony. So, Panchil or the five principles of peaceful coexistence were first formally enunciated or articulated in the agreement on trade and intercourse between the Tibet region of China and India. This agreement was signed on April 29, 1954. In the preamble of this agreement, it was stated that the two governments that is the Chinese government and the Indian government have resolved to enter into the present agreement based on the following principles and those principles were first mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, second mutual non-aggression, third mutual non-interference, fourth equality and mutual benefit and fifth peaceful coexistence. 
after this agreement the chinese premier or the chinese prime minister visited india in this visit he and the then prime minister of india jawaharlal nehru issued a joint statement in june 1954 this joint statement elaborated their vision of punch shield the punch shield framework is not only for relations between the two countries but also for their relations with all other countries this is because they wanted to establish a solid foundation for peace and security in the world and this punch shield gave importance to the voice of newly established countries who were seeking the space to consolidate their independence which they won hardly this is because punch shield provided an alternative ideology which is dedicated to peace and development of all and this ideology as the basis for international interaction whether the interaction is bilateral or multilateral bilateral means between two countries and multilateral means between three or more countries and in the joint statement the two prime ministers that is the prime minister of india and china also expressed that the adoption of punch shield will also help in creating an area of peace and if circumstances permit this peace can be enlarged which will lead to decreasing the chances of war and strengthening the cause of peace all over the world so now this vision of uh, indian prime minister and chinese prime minister caught the attention of peoples of asia and also the world so this punch shield was incorporated into the 10 principles of international peace and cooperation this 10 principles of international uh, peace and cooperation was enunciated in the declaration which was issued by the 1955 bandung conference of 29 afro asian countries in april 1955 representatives from 29 governments of asian and african nations gathered in bandung which is the capital city of indonesia they gathered to discuss peace and the role of third world in the cold war and economic development and the decolonization era in this uh, third world means the developing countries of asia africa and latin america so the 10 principles which were adopted by this uh, conference incorporated the punch shield that is the five principles of punch shield and later punch shield gained more importance because it was adopted by united nations general assembly the united nations general assembly adopted a, a resolution on peaceful coexistence which was presented by india yugoslavia and sweden together it was adopted in december 1957 so this adoption by united nations general assembly emphasized the universal relevance of punch shield then in the year 1961 the conference of non aligned nations which was held in belgrade accepted punch shield as the principal core of non aligned movement also know that belgrade is the capital city of serbia so from these we can know that how punch shield was considered important at that point of time so based on these importance only the chinese ambassador to india has urged india to follow the principles of peaceful coexistence in the bilateral relations between india and china and we can say that today punch shield can help the world to move away from the traditional concepts the traditional concepts like balance of power competitive security the consequent searching for an enemy and doing activities based on conflicts rather than for cooperation all these traditional concepts of the world can be removed by punch shield however some experts feel that in today's world it is not enough that punch shield be promoted as an alternative ideology that empowers the less developed countries rather it should be made clear that punch shield is an ideology for the entire world and it is relevant to the developed countries of the globe as it is relevant to the less developed countries and it should also be stressed that the principles of panchil are not just empowering principles but they are also guiding principles because it incorporates certain code of behavior among the countries some experts also lists the essence of panchil they say the essence of panchil is the non use of power and the approach of tolerance between countries and the approach of living one's life and learning from others and also not interfering in others business and also not being interfered by others so these are some of the information related to punch shield with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the split practice question will be discussed in the last session this news article is about a statement by nasa 
on Vikram lander of Chandrayaan 2. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of news article is given here for your reference. The Space Agency of USA which is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration or NASA has released a statement on the Vikram lander of Chandrayaan 2. NASA has officially said that Chandrayaan 2's lander that is Vikram had a hard landing on the moon. So, in this context we can remember that Chandrayaan 2 was India's second mission to the moon and the first mission was Chandrayaan 1 which was launched in 2008 and the second mission was launched this year that is in 2019 and the important constituents of this Chandrayaan 2 mission were an orbiter, a lander which is named as Vikram and a rover which is named as Pragyan and this rover was placed within this lander. Now, you should know that a lander is built to descend towards and also come to rest on a planet or moon by usually transporting something to the surface. And a rover is a space exploration vehicle which is designed to move and explore the surface of a planet or a surface of the moon. And usually landers carry rovers for space exploration. And we know that the objective of Chandrayaan 2 was to soft land the lander near the lunar south pole and also to explore moon's south polar region. But unfortunately, the moon lander Vikram crash landed to the lunar surface. So, subsequently the connection between the lander and the orbiter was lost. So, what is soft landing and what is hard or crash landing? See, a moon landing is the landing of a spacecraft on the surface of the moon. So, this moon landing includes both manned missions and the robotic missions. And the landing can be of two types. One is hard landing and the second is soft landing. A hard landing occurs when a spacecraft hits the ground with a greater speed and force. And the speed and force is much more greater than a normal landing. So, a hard landing has a potential to damage the spacecraft and its components. So, we can say hard landing is more of an uncontrolled landing. Now, a soft landing occurs when a spacecraft or a lander lands without causing damage or destruction to the lander or the components in it. So, we can say a soft landing is more controlled landing with least damage. Hence, soft landing means landing on the surface of any celestial body by reducing the speed of a spacecraft for a perfect touchdown without any damage to the spacecraft or without any hazard on the landing site. So, developing a lander for soft landing requires a new set of technology and these new set of technologies were developed by ISRO and they were also incorporated in the Vikram lander and these various new technologies used in the Vikram lander are the use of retro rockets which is used to reduce the speed while landing and position detection cameras and the altimeters which is used to measure altitude then uh, touchdown sensors then solar panels then hazard detection and avoidance camera etc. All these were supposed to make soft landing and then the payloads will be deployed along with the rover Pragyan. But despite these new technologies, some failure in the system caused Chandrayaan 2 to hard land on the moon and NASA has said that the high precision camera of its lunar reconnaissance orbiter that is LRO was able to get a clear picture of Vikram's crash site and when this picture was taken by LRO, it was dusk or sunset. So, the area or the terrain of the moon was covered in large shadows. So, NASA has said that it is possible that the Vikram lander is hiding in a shadow. So, to have a better picture of Vikram lander, lighting is necessary. The lighting will be favorable when LRO passes over the site in October. And in October, it has to once again attempt to locate and take an image of the lander Vikram. So, now in this context, let us also know about lunar reconnaissance orbiter. This lunar reconnaissance orbiter is the first mission of the lunar precursor robotic program or in short LPRP. Reconnaissance means surveying or exploration or doing research. This LPRP is a program of robotic spacecraft missions of NASA. Now, this mission is a precursor to prepare for future human spaceflight missions to the moon by NASA. It will gather data on the probable risks that humans will have to face in the moon 
when NASA sends humans in its future manned moon missions. This LRO mission was launched in the year 2009. So, as we saw in the beginning, its objective is reconnaissance that is for observing or surveying the moon surface. This mission is expected to provide critical information about the suitable safe landing sites in the moon and the LRO will also analyze the topography of moon surface and it will take high resolution images of sites of interest like it has taken the image of Vikram's landing site and the LRO will also check for potential resources in the moon. So, in this discussion, we just saw about the statement made by NASA on Vikram lander and we revised about Chandrayaan 2 and the Vikram landers and about soft landing and hard landing and we also saw about lunar reconnaissance orbiter of NASA. With this, we have come to the end of this news article discussion. The display practice question will be discussed in the last session. This news article is about the speech delivered by the Indian Prime Minister at United Nations General Assembly. The syllabus relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference. We have discussed many times about the main organs of United Nations. They are the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the International Court of Justice and the UN Secretariat. And all these six organs were established in the year 1945 when the UN was founded. So, General Assembly is one of the main organs of United Nations and this General Assembly is usually referred to as United Nations General Assembly or UNGA. So, before discussing the news article, let us see in brief about UNGA. UNGA is the main representative organ of the UN and UN has 193 member states and all these 193 member states of UN are represented in the General Assembly. So, this makes the General Assembly the only UN body with universal representation and we know that India is also a member of United Nations. In this assembly, the general debate happens. So, it is a deliberative organ of the UN as well. Each year in September, the full UN membership meets in the General Assembly Hall which is situated in New York and they meet for the annual General Assembly session. In this session, general debate happens in which many heads of state attends the session and addresses the session. We saw that UNGA is a representative organ and we also saw that it is a deliberative organ and also know that UNGA is the policy making organ of UN. So, decisions on important questions such as decisions on peace and security, then admission of new members and budgetary matters all are decided in UNGA. Also know that the decisions on the matter that we just saw require a two-third of majority of the General Assembly and decisions on other questions are taken by a simple majority and each year the General Assembly elects the President. So, the elected president will serve for a term of one year. We saw that every year there will be a general debate. So, the 74th session of UNGA is going on now in New York. This year's theme for this general debate is galvanizing multilateral efforts for poverty eradication, quality education, climate action and inclusion. So, in this 74th session only our prime minister has given his address. So, during his speech, the Prime Minister has covered on various aspects like terrorism, sanitation, environment and also about the initiatives taken by India on these aspects. So, let us see them one by one. First is on terrorism. Our Prime Minister has termed terrorism as the biggest challenge for the world. He also noted that there is a lack of unanimity or oneness among the member nations on the issue of terrorism. He has urged the nations to unite against terrorism for the sake of humanity. He also urged the United Nations to adopt a new direction against terrorism. He also quoted that India is a country that has given the world not war but Buddha's message of peace. Then in his speech he has also mentioned about the initiatives of government of India. First he mentioned about the clean India mission which is nothing but the Swachh Bharat mission. This Swachh Bharat mission was launched by the Prime Minister of India on 2nd October 2014. It was launched to accelerate the efforts to achieve universal sanitation coverage and also to put more focus on sanitation. And also remember that the mission coordinator 
of Swachh Bharat Mission is the Secretary of the Ministry of Jal Shakti. And remember that there are two sub-missions under Swachh Bharat. One is Swachh Bharat Mission Gramin and the other one is Swachh Bharat Mission Urban. So, this Swachh Bharat Mission aims to achieve a Swachh Bharat which means a clean India by the year 2019. And this mission will be a apt tribute to Mahatma Gandhi on 150th birth anniversary. Because Mahatma Gandhi noted that sanitation is more important than independence. And he made cleanliness and sanitation as an integral part of Gandhian way of living. So, to uphold this idea of Mahatma Gandhi, the Swachh Bharat mission was introduced. So, in line with this, it is also expected that our Prime Minister will declare India as open defecation free during the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi which is next month. So, regarding this Swachh Bharat mission, our Prime Minister has made a statement in the General Assembly. He has told that when a developing country is able to successfully implement the world's biggest sanitation campaign within the Clean India mission for Indian citizens, it is an inspirational message for the entire world. He even pointed that under this Swachh Bharat mission, India has built over 110 million toilets that is 11 crore toilets in just 5 years. Now, these are the informations which are given in the front page article of today's newspaper. There is one more news article which is titled as Modi touts development schemes. Here the word tout means an attempt to sell or market anything in a direct way. So, the title means that Prime Minister has marketed the schemes of his government in the address to UNGA. The Prime Minister has highlighted the government's achievements in financial inclusion, biometric identities, health coverage and the Clean India mission. Here the financial inclusion scheme mentioned by the Prime Minister is nothing but the Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana and for biometric identity it is the Aadhaar scheme and uh, health coverage scheme is nothing but the Aishman Bharat scheme and Clean India mission is the Swachh Bharat scheme which we just saw. So, now let us see some of the points made by our Prime Minister related to environment. He reminded the other member nations of UNGA that India had one of the lowest emissions on per capita basis. As you can see in this picture which is based on 2017 data, India is one of the lowest emitters of carbon dioxide in metric tons per capita. India is the lowest as compared to other countries like United States of America, Australia, China etc. And our Prime Minister has also mentioned certain targets of India in various fields during his speech. The first target is regarding the single-use plastic. This single-use plastic is a major contributor to environmental pollution. And during his Independence Day speech on 15th August 2019, our PM even asked the citizens of India to avoid using single-use plastic. And the next target is about eradication of tuberculosis. He has mentioned about India's target to eradicate tuberculosis by 2025. This strategic plan of India is called the National Strategic Plan for Tuberculosis 2017 to 2025 elimination by 2025. Now, we have discussed about this strategy in detail in our 31st August the Hindi news analysis. The link is given in description box. Please have a look at it. The next target mentioned by the Prime Minister is about renewable energy. We know that India has set a target for the creation of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by the year 2022. And in the Climate Action Summit which was held recently, our Prime Minister has said that once we reach this target, that is once we reach 175 gigawatts by 2022, then this target will be increased to more than double of this target. He said that the target will be to build 450 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity. But for this target, no time frame has been announced by the Prime Minister. And we have discussed about this target and the Climate Action Summit on our 24th September Hindi News Analysis video. The link for the same is also given in the description box. And then after these, our Prime Minister has invited all the countries to join the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. So, what is this Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure? It is an international coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure which is in short called as CDRI. 
it will serve as a platform where knowledge is generated and exchanged on different aspects of disaster and climate resilience of infrastructure this coalition will bring the technical expertise from a multitude of stakeholders together and while bringing together the technical expertise it will create a mechanism to assist countries to upgrade their capacities and practices with regard to infrastructure development in accordance with their risk context and economic needs and the news article also mentions that this initiative has been launched by india with countries such as united kingdom australia fiji and maldives and this initiative will build infrastructure that is resilient to natural disasters if you see the news article the news article mentions that in between the address the prime minister quoted the words of a tamil poet it was the words of tamil poet kaniyan poongundrana these words were mentioned in a tamil literature called as purananur the words are yadum oore yavarum kelir it means we belong to all places and to everyone so by quoting this our prime minister has told that this sense of belonging beyond borders is unique to india he also said that in the last 5 years india has worked towards strengthening its centuries old great tradition of fraternity among nations so he noted that all the issues raised and the initiatives that are started by india requires a collective effort to address the serious global challenges and issues and while ending his speech prime minister even quoted the words of swami vivekananda he mentioned the message given by swami vivekananda to the world during the world parliament of religions in chicago in the year 1893 the message was harmony and peace and not dissension dissension means disagreement or dispute so by this our prime minister has conveyed that the message of india to the world is still the same which is harmony and peace and not dispute the quotes mentioned by our prime minister during the speech will be helpful for you to mention in the mains answer writing so take a note of it with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion the practice question displayed here will be discussed in the last session moving on to the discussion of last news article which is about the 10 year sanitation strategy which is launched by the government of india the syllabus relevant to the analysis of news article is given here for your reference in the last discussion we saw that our prime minister is going to declare on october 2 that is on gandhi jayanti that india is completely open defecation free or in short odf so what is this odf or open defecation free according to the definition given by the government open defecation free is the termination of fecal oral transmission and under this definition no visible feces should be found in a village or in an environment and every household as well as every public or community institution should use safe technology option for disposal of feces in this safe technology option means no contamination of surface soil or the ground water or the surface water and the excreta should be inaccessible to flies or animals and there should be no handling of fresh excreta and the area should be free from odor and unsightly condition unsightly means very unpleasant to look or very ugly so based on the swachh bharat mission india has achieved open defecation free and our prime minister is going to declare india as completely open defecation free on october 2 now to maintain this status of open defecation free the center has launched a 10 year strategy the strategy is 10 year rural sanitation strategy of 2019 to 2029 it was launched by the department of drinking water and sanitation which works under ministry of jal shakti so as we saw in the beginning this strategy will focus on sustaining the sanitation behavior change that has been achieved in the rural areas under the swachh bharat mission gramin this strategy will ensure that no one is left behind and it will ensure the increased access to solid waste management and liquid waste management and the state governments have been advised to ensure that no one is left behind and in any case when a household does not have access to toilet then they will be given priority and will be facilitated to build a toilet 
Now you should note that since the launch of Swachh Bharat Mission Gramin in the year 2014, over 10 crore toilets have been built in rural areas. and over 5.9 lakh villages 699 districts and 35 states and union territories have declared themselves open defecation free so now they have declared themselves as odf now it is important to remain as odf that is why the government has designed this new strategy now this new strategy has been prepared by drinking water and sanitation department in consultation with state governments and other stakeholders the strategy lays down a framework to guide local governments policy makers implementers and other relevant stakeholders it will guide their planning for odf plus where everyone uses a toilet and every village has access to solid and liquid waste management Now in this ODF plus is an area where along with regular availability and usage of toilets there is a management of solid and liquid waste and there is a cleanliness of water resources and there is a maintenance of public and household toilets and there is a awareness on personal hygiene at the highest level so if all these are there then that area will be called as ODF plus now this new 10 year strategy focuses on the need for states and union territories to continue their efforts to sustain the gains of the swachh bharat mission now this will be done through capacity strengthening and by iec iec stands for information education and communication so through iec odf will be sustained and through organic waste management also and also through plastic waste management grey water management and black water management in this grey water can be defined as any domestic waste water that is produced and this excludes sewage the main difference between grey water and sewage is the organic loading because sewage has a much larger organic loading compared to grey water and when this grey water is treated properly it can be put to good use this treated water can be used for laundry and toilet flushing and also irrigation of plants and this treated grey water can be used to irrigate both food and non food producing plants the nutrients which are present in grey water are phosphorus and nitrogen and they provide an excellent food source for these plants and the major benefit of using grey water is it will reduce our dependency on fresh water and it will reduce the amount of uh, grey water which is entering into sewers so that is why grey water management is very important and in this black water management black water is any waste from toilets or urinals so this black water is the sewage water and it contains disease causing bacteria and viruses that can result in human illness from direct contact and also by consumption of affected fish and shellfish this black water contributes to nutrient build up in ecosystems and which results in the changes to habitat so the black water management is also important and the strategy also speaks about potential collaborations with development partners and civil society organizations and also about inter government partnerships and it also highlights the innovative models for sanitation financing sanitation financing means providing loans or money for maintaining the sanitation requirements of a household with this we have come to the end of this news article discussion and we have also come to the end of our article discussion sessions the split practice question will be discussed in the next session we have come to the last session that is the practice questions discussion session this first question is based on eco sensitive zones three statements are given we have to choose the correct statement the first statement states they are declared under the forest conservation act of 1980 now this statement is wrong because during discussion we saw that eco sensitive zones or the eco fragile zones are declared under section 3 of environment protection act of 1986 and this section empowers the central government to take all necessary measures for protecting and improving the quality of the environment and for preventing and controlling the environmental pollution so for this purpose only eco sensitive zones are declared by the government so this statement is wrong but also know that this forest conservation act of 1980 was amended in the year 1988 and it is a regulatory mechanism to protect the rich biodiversity and natural heritage of our nation and it also permits only unavoidable use of forest land for various developmental purposes and this 
act is regulatory and not prohibitory. So, remember that. Now, in this second statement states, it acts as shock absorbers to the protected areas by managing human activities around the areas. During discussion, we saw that shock absorbers helps to reduce or mitigate the worst effects of uh, human activities on environment. And this statement also means the same. So, this statement is correct. And the third statement states, commercial use of natural water resources and use of polythene bags by shopkeepers is a prohibited activity in eco-sensitive zones. Now, this statement may seem right because uh, use of natural water resources and using of polythene bags, we may think it is a prohibited activity. But no, in the eco-sensitive zones, these comes under regulated activities. And the felling of trees, establishment of hotels and resorts, movement of vehicles at night and widening of roads, all these are regulated activities. But the prohibited activities include commercial mining, setting of sawmills or setting of uh, industries which causes different types of pollution or establishment of major hydroelectric projects and commercial use of wood or discharging effluents or discharging any solid waste or even production of hazardous substances are the prohibited activities. So, these two are not prohibited, they are regulated activities and these are given under the guidelines framed by the Union Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Here the question asks for the correct statements, here statement 2 is the only correct statement. So, our final correct answer to this question is option C, 2 only. Now, this next question is based on principles of peaceful coexistence. Four principles are given and we have to choose which among the following is not a principle under the punch shield or the principles of peaceful coexistence. First one is mutual respect for sovereignty, this is correct. Second one is mutual non-aggression, this is also correct. The third one is mutual interference. Interference means obstructing or hindering. Here it states mutual interference. But for a peaceful coexistence, there should not be any interference. So, this means this is wrong. And the fourth one says mutual benefit. Yes, as a part of peaceful coexistence, mutual benefit is also necessary. So, here 1, 2, 4 are correct, only 3 is wrong. So, our final correct answer to this question is option C, 3 only. Now, also remember that the five principles include mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity, mutual respect for each other's sovereignty, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference, equality and mutual benefit and fifth one peaceful coexistence. Now, this next question is based on lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. First statement states, it is a robotic moon mission of European Space Agency. Now, in this the first part is correct, it is a robotic moon mission. The second part states, European Space Agency. Now, this is wrong. This mission is a mission of NASA, which is the space agency of USA. So, this statement is wrong. The second statement states, it is expected to provide critical information about the suitable safe landing sites in the moon. Now, this statement is correct. Not only this, the LRO will analyze the topography of the moon surface and it will also take high resolution images of the sites which are of interest. And today's news article was with respect to one of the images and it was the image of a crater produced by Vikram Lander of Chandrayaan 2 mission. So, in this question, statement 2 is the correct statement. So, the final correct answer to this question is option B, 2 only. Now, this next question is based on United Nations General Assembly. First statement states, it is the only UN body with universal representation. Now, universal representation means all the members of the UN body should be represented in this General Assembly. Yes, they are represented. UN has 193 member states and they are all represented in the General Assembly. So, this makes United Nations General Assembly as the only UN body with universal representation. So, this statement is correct. The second statement states, Secretary General heads the General Assembly. Now, you should know that as per the Charter of UN, one of the functions of UNGA is to appoint the Secretary General based on the recommendations of UN Security Council. And the Secretary General will head the UN Secretariat. So, this means the Secretary General is not the head of General Assembly. 
the general assembly is headed by the president who is elected by the united nations general assembly so this makes this statement as a incorrect statement here the question asks for the correct statement here statement 1 is the correct statement so the final correct answer to this question is option a 1 only now this question is based on 10 year rural sanitation strategy 2019 to 2029 the first statement states it focuses on sustaining the sanitation behavior change achieved in swachh bharat mission gramin now this statement is correct this is the only objective and the major objective of this strategy it aims to sustain the sanitation behavior change which was achieved in the rural areas by the swachh bharat mission gramin and it aims for india to remain open defecation free so this statement is correct the second statement states it is launched by the ministry of health and family welfare now when we talk about sanitation you might think it comes under the field of health but no this strategy was launched by the department of drinking water and sanitation which works under the ministry of jal shakti so which means it is not launched by ministry of health and family welfare so this statement is wrong the final correct answer to this question is option a one only with this we are ending today's hindi news analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation mm -hmm.